For this latest edition of Eye on Yellow Fever, we're inside the key African laboratory where expert clinicians race to diagnose yellow fever cases. We will receive at Institut Pasteur de Dakar a message from the country and the WHO to inform us about the shipment of that sample to be confirmed. It's only after confirmation in our laboratory that the outbreak will be officially declared. It's central to the process of responding to and targeting yellow fever outbreaks. Both speed and accuracy are of vital importance to minimize cases. When we receive many samples, that's usually emergencies, and we have to manage this. Uh, that's not easy, really. I can say that that's not easy. It's work that requires great expertise, handling up-close samples that may contain yellow fever virus and other highly infectious diseases. We have to use all the individual protective equipments and also the biosafety cabinets. All the samples have to be handled under these biosafety cabinets to avoid contamination of the staff or the environment. And that's very, very important. The risk of outbreaks of the deadly disease yellow fever is both significant and growing. This is down to a cocktail of contributing factors, including climate change and increasing pressure on land, greater movement of people, particularly into cities, and a resurgence in a highly connected world of the mosquito species that carries and transmits the disease. Yellow fever may not be the most obvious global public health threat, but it's a disease with no cure and a growing risk that must be taken seriously. We are Eliminate Yellow Fever Epidemics, that's I for short. From the world's most senior public health experts to those on the front line of combating this deadly disease wherever it emerges, we have the inside story on yellow fever's expanding global risk. This is Eye on Yellow Fever. Welcome. I'm Ines Hamem, and I'm part of the Emergency Response Communications team at the World Health Organization. It's my pleasure to join the team as a new host for the Eye on Yellow Fever podcast. This time, we're taking you inside one of the most important and timely stages of yellow fever diagnosis. My name is Gamu Fall, and I'm the head of the Yellow Fever Regional Reference Laboratory at the WHO Collaborating Center for Arbovirus and Hemorrhagic Fever Viruses at the Institut Pasteur de Dakar in Senegal. Hi, Dr. Fell. How are you? Hi, Inas. I'm good. And you? I'm good. Thank you. So you're actually inside one of the laboratories where a huge part of the fever testing and research takes place. Could you just talk us through where you are, describe what's around you and what activities take place there? Currently, I'm in the lab where molecular diagnostic of yellow fever is conducted. Around me, we have a biosafety cabinet, a freezer, and uh, an automatic viral RNA extraction equipment. And we have also some small equipments like vortex, centrifuge, and pipettes. It's all that you'd expect in a sophisticated biomedical lab. In case you're wondering, a vortex centrifuge is a high-speed spinning apparatus. It separates out the constituent fluids in a sample to make it ready for testing. In this regional reference laboratory, we have a molecular biology platform. And in this platform, we are conducting the PCR testing. Dr. Fall is based in one of three African regional reference laboratories for yellow fever diagnosis. There's one in Cameroon, one in Uganda, and there's one where Dr. Fall is located at the Institut Pasteur de Dakar in the capital of Senegal. Hosting this regional lab in the context of the WHO Yellow Fever Laboratory Network means first that we are national reference laboratory for Senegal. And second, we have to provide WHO and other African countries with technical assistance and support to perform and coordinate laboratory activities on yellow fever. So in other words, we have to confirm first yellow fever cases in Senegal, and second, diagnostic results from other African countries by using different methods. Different parts of IP Dakar look after different stages of the testing process. For Senegal itself, it runs initial or first stage yellow fever tests. 
There are counterpart national laboratories all over Africa that run these initial in-country tests. Then, for Senegal and 18 West African countries in total, IP Dakar provides second-stage confirmatory yellow fever testing. It's only after this confirmatory testing at a regional reference lab like IP Dakar that a yellow fever outbreak can be officially declared. Before talking about the outbreak, let me talk about the routine surveillance of yellow fever, which is conducted in all countries of the Yellow Fever Network by the Ministry of Health in collaboration with the WHO. And when there is a suspected case of yellow fever, a blood sample is collected and shipped first to the country's national reference laboratory. If this lab finds the sample positive, it is from that moment that we will receive at Institut Pasteur de Dakar a message from the country and the WHO to inform us about the shipment of that sample to be confirmed. It's only after confirmation in our laboratory that the outbreak will be officially declared. From that point, if needed and validated by the WHO, IP Dakar can deploy a team in that country for local technical support. And so on average, during the routine surveillance, how many samples does your lab receive a week compared to, for example, if there's a a suspected or confirmed outbreak, um, what volume does that uh, number of samples increase by? So for the routine surveillance, we received around 20 to 30 samples per week from the different African countries. But during outbreak, this can increase to 40 to 50 samples per week. Once the samples have arrived, you need to obviously make sure that they're in good condition and that you're able to analyze them. What is required for a sample to be in good enough condition for you to use it for analysis? What is required is to do the triple packaging of the samples and also to ship them with the cold chain from the country to Senegal. This is very important for the diagnostic. Cold chain is a term for the strict temperature controls required to keep a sample in good condition. It needs to have been frozen quickly and Dr. Fowl's team need to be confident that it's remained carefully frozen throughout its transportation to the lab. At the sample received, we have to check first if the cold chain was maintained during the transport. If there was a rupture of this cold chain, we consider that these samples arrived in the lab with bad conditions. We will still conduct the test, but we keep in mind that the the cold chain was not good at the sample received in the laboratory. And of course, we know that this can have a negative impact on the results. So we still conduct the test, but we consider that in the results interpretation. On average, how many of the samples that you receive are not in good enough condition to be properly analysed? Right now, uh, after the implementation of the ACE strategy, I can say that this is very rare. But before, we had many issues with that, with many countries since, let's say, 2018. From 2018 to now, I can say this is very rare. It's improved a lot with the ACE strategy. Dr. Fowl credits the I strategy for a big cut in improperly transported samples. Among the improvements brought in by I is hugely streamlining the sample shipment process from national laboratories to regional reference laboratories like IP Dakar. The target for this transport process, known as IOPS, is to get samples safely from national to regional labs within five working days. I has also significantly upgraded laboratory capacity Until 2017, Senegal was Africa's only laboratory capable of confirmatory yellow fever testing. Now, it has counterparts in Cameroon and Uganda. But while things have greatly improved, the checks carried out by Dr. Fal's team are still meticulous. This is the other things that we have to check when the samples arrive in the lab. So we have to check if the tubes are properly closed. If not, this can uh, lead to contamination, cross-contamination between the tubes. We have to check also if we receive enough volume of samples, as we have many uh, techniques that we have to conduct here at Institut Pasteur de Dakar. And finally, we have to check if the investigation forms are sent with the samples and if they are fully filled. So if we lack some information on these investigation form, this could impact also the results interpretation. 
So we need to have the date of symptom onset, the date of sampling, if the person received a yellow fever vaccination and the date of the vaccination and so on. And if we don't have them, of course, uh, we have some issues to interpret uh, the results that we have. Dr. Gamu Falev Institute Pasteur de Dakar in Senegal will be back with us very soon. You're listening to Eye on Yellow Fever from the Global Coalition of Partners working together to end yellow fever epidemics by 2026. If you're enjoying this episode, we would love for you to share it with friends or colleagues that you think would be interested in learning more about yellow fever or have an interest in infectious diseases. You can also subscribe to the podcast so that new episodes are always automatically downloaded to your device. Now, back to IP Dakar's Regional Reference Laboratory and to Dr. Fall for the next stages in the sample testing process. So, assuming the cold chain is working properly and the right information is included with the sample, what's the first step that you take inside your laboratory when that sample is received? Okay, so when these samples are received and we check that everything is okay, We record the samples in the sample reception book and we store them at minus 80 for testing. Usually we test them the day after uh, the receipt. In the laboratory, we have different tests that we are conducting based on the yellow fever testing algorithm that we agreed with the WHO. For the acute samples, so when I talk about acute samples, I mean samples that are at the early stage of the disease. For those samples, we have to conduct PCR. And for the late samples, so samples collected in the late stage of the disease, for those samples, we conduct ELISA, mainly IgM antibodies. And uh, there is a window in between that we have to conduct both techniques, PCR and ELISA, to detect yellow fever. And finally, for some particular samples, we also have to contact what we call PRNT for confirmation. Okay, so now we've hit some acronyms and technical terms that we need to unpick. Dr. Fall talks about three different types of tests. PCR, which stands for polymerase chain reaction, ELISA, and PRNT. While two of those names might be new to you, I'm sure most of us nowadays are familiar with the term PCR. Does the PCR test for COVID differ from a PCR test for yellow fever? PCR is just a molecular diagnostic tool for the detection of viral genome, and it is done usually in the acute stage of a disease. ELISA is a serological diagnostic tool that we use to detect antibodies that were induced by the natural infection or the yellow fever vaccination. While a PCR detects presence of the disease itself, the ELISA test relies on a heightened presence of the antibodies generated by the body to fight off infection. This underlines Dr. Fall's earlier point about how it's crucially important that paperwork accompanying samples is always complete and accurate. An ELISA test can give a positive result for the presence of yellow fever antibodies, both when the patient has caught yellow fever and if they've previously had the vaccine. So it's of vital importance for the laboratory teams to know whether a patient's been vaccinated. And it gets trickier. A positive ELISA test doesn't necessarily mean the presence of yellow fever. The problem we have here is in the flaviviruses families like yellow fever, dengue, Zika or West Nile, we have what we call cross reactions with the ELISA test. One sample can be positive for two or three viruses at the same time. In this case, we have to conduct a more specific test, which is called plaque reduction neutralization test, or PRNT, to do the confirmation. Can you tell us a little bit more about the PRNT test? Yes, PRNT test is a confirmatory test, which is considered the laboratory gold standard test for the detection and quantification of neutralizing antibodies against yellow fever. For assessing the protective immune response following yellow fever, natural infection or vaccination. 
Dr. Fell, if, if the PRNT test is the gold standard, doesn't it make more sense to just use that test immediately on the samples or are there other challenges or issues related to the PRNT test? We cannot use it uh, as primary testing because it's a very difficult test. So we have to conduct the other tests that I already talked about, mainly the ELISA, uh, because if the ELISA is negative, we don't need to conduct PRNT. And can you explain to me a little bit more about why the PRNT is so difficult? Because this requires specific cell culture facilities. It requires also highly uh, trained staff and also very standardized controls to have reproducible results. And also the timeline of this test is quite long. It can take several days, four to five days for yellow fever. All these restrictions confine the PRNT to only reference laboratory. I think in the network, there is no national lab that is conducting PRNT. Only the three regional reference laboratories are conducting PRNT because of these uh, issues. So the time factor is also an issue, obviously. You've agreed with WHO that there are certain deadlines that need to be met when you're analyzing the samples and delivering the results. Why is that such an important factor? Let's say first, we have agreed with WHO from sample received to report the results for PCR and ELISA in seven days and the PRNT results in 21 days, so let's say three weeks. But we know that quicker is better because it allows to quickly detect the outbreak and set up very quickly the response to avoid the spread of the positive cases. So that's very important to be very quick in the diagnostic. It's a painstaking, multifaceted process. Attention to detail, speed and expertise are all key to a successful outcome. And as Dr. Fall has detailed, it isn't always easy even with the range of tests available, to be completely certain of a result. There is always interpretation required. The test result has to be assessed in the round, taking in what is known about the patient's vaccination status, as well as other factors like clinical presentation. But what happens when IP Dakar or other regional reference labs can confirm an outbreak of yellow fever? You had mentioned before that an outbreak is only announced once you have confirm that in the laboratory. So what happens between you analyzing all the samples and then making that decision that there is an outbreak or there is a confirmed case? What's the process and then how do you make that that information known? When all the results are available, we do the analysis and a final conclusion is sent by email to the country and to the WHO. That's the way we we report the, the outbreaks. That's not easy, really. I can say that that's not easy. Yeah, but we we love this job, so we just do. Dr. Fall is rightly very proud of the teams around her, their expertise and their commitment to the life-saving work of getting speedy test results back out of the lab and to the people and teams that need them. And indeed, Senegal, and particularly the Institute de Pasteur in Dakar, where Dr. Fall is based, have a historic and continuing association with the fight against yellow fever. First, I would like to say that Senegal has a very long-standing experience of yellow fever. Our history with yellow fever started in 1927, when the virus was discovered in Nigeria and Senegal, more or less at the same time. And later, in 1937, the yellow fever vaccine has been developed at the Institut Pasteur in Senegal, and this activity is still ongoing here. And currently, we are one out of the four yellow fever vaccine manufacturers in the world. This is very important for us. Now, knowing that there are not enough vaccine doses in the world, the new strategy of Institut Pasteur de Dakar aims to build a new infrastructure to increase its production capacity. The capacity that we have currently is around 5 to 10. And with this new infrastructure, we, we want to reach 30 million of doses, of vaccine doses. And this capacity could be doubled in the event of an epidemic. And this is really important. We think that the first vaccine doses of the Africa Maril will be probably available by the end of next year.
If you've heard previous episodes of Eye on Yellow Fever, you'll have a good sense of just how important that is. In the 2016 outbreak in Angola and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a global shortage of vaccine supplies made it extremely difficult to stop the spread of infection. Senegal has taken steps to prevent such a situation by, among other things, building laboratory capacity and introducing routine vaccination. Now coming to the outbreaks, we had five major outbreaks of yellow fever between 1965 and 2002. And in 2007, a mass vaccination campaign has been conducted. And since then, only sporadic cases or minor outbreaks have been detected in the country. And for all these cases, of course, vaccination campaigns targeted the affected regions have been conducted. So we can say that also the, the high vaccination coverage that we have here the eastern part of the country is still considered to be at very high risk of endemic yellow fever transmission. And this is due in particular to the persistence of the disease in uh, non-human primates in that area. So under these conditions, the unvaccinated people remain very vulnerable to yellow fever when they visit this part of the country. The vaccination of yellow fever is included in the routine vaccination of uh, babies in the context of the expanded program on immunization. And of course, this high vaccination coverage we have here has a very positive impact. Thanks very much to Dr. Gamu Fall at Senegal's Institute Pasteur de Dakar for taking the time to speak to us for this episode. It's been so fascinating. An important reminder before we leave you that word of mouth is so important when it comes to reaching new audiences with podcasts. So if you have colleagues or friends who you think would find this episode useful or interesting, please let them know about us by sending them a link. You can select subscribe or follow to make sure that all future episodes of Eye on Yellow Fever are automatically downloaded directly to your device. Thank you for being with us this time. This episode was produced by Dave Howard with research from Emilia Janssen and sound design by Adam Whaley. I'm Ines Hamem. Eye on Yellow Fever is a Bengo media production for the Eliminate Yellow Fever epidemic strategy. (laughs) 